Thank you for taking a couple of minutes out of your lunch to come to this one. This is actually um, probably my most exciting talk for the day, at least from my perspective, because I'm gonna be talking a little bit about process within NGRX. I'm not actually gonna be writing any code this time. And process is really important for an NGRX application because it helps you write higher quality and more maintainable programs. And I'm really excited to be talking about quality because like we said this morning, quality is at the heart of NGRX. So where I work, we work on industrial controls. So if our software fails, we can actually create real life dangerous situations for people. So as a result, Brandon and I have tried really hard to bake quality into NGRX. So quality, well, it's kind of achieved through architecture and process. NGRX gives you architecture out of the box. That's one of its appeals. But what it does not give you is process. And with poor process, you're gonna risk writing really low quality applications. So today I wanna to talk to you about one particular NGRX process that will help you write those high quality applications. And that's the process of good action hygiene. So in an NGRX application, an action is a unified interface for describing an event in our application for any number of sources. These could be user interaction, users playing with your components. It can be communication with your backend API. They can also model interactions with device events, like, for instance, the full screen API. And at a minimum, an action has a type, and it can have any additional properties on it that we call the payload of an action. And these actions are collected, and they form what's called a global unified action stream. So with this action stream, we pass them to reducers. Reducers decide how state transitions as a result of an action. From there, actions in state get delivered to effects. Effects can uh, start the process of integrating with your backend APIs or browser APIs. Effects can then dispatch more actions into the system. So they're kind of important. Really, you could say that they form the bedrock of an NGRX application. Actions are the inputs and outputs of so many systems in NGRX. And it's really important that we're gonna get the foundation of our applications right by writing high quality actions. So, how do we write good actions? Well, in my experience, there's really three pitfalls to writing a good action. I'm gonna share what these pitfalls are, what traps lie at the, bo at the bottom of them, and how you can avoid them. So the first pitfall, and this one's reusing actions. Why does this come about? Well, like I said, I'm a big fan of food, so I'm writing a menu ordering app to order food items. And on my menu details page, I can add any number of items to my cart. So if the user presses the add burger button, I wanna go ahead and dispatch an action, something like burgers add one. But users can go to the burgers page, and they can kinda of do the same thing, right? they could go add a burger to their cart from the burger details page. And so I want to dispatch the same action, burgers, add one. Well, I think this comes out because when we go to write these reducer functions, they're gonna kinda of cause the same state change. In both cases, we're gonna be adding burgers to our cart. This burger reducer maintains that collection of burgers in the system. And really, I could view this action as a command. And so I think the need to reuse actions comes out because we tend to view actions like commands. But if I read this reducer in a week or a year, I won't have enough information to know where this burger is coming from in my application. I can't tell by looking at this reducer if this is coming from the cart page or the menu page or the burger details page. What if instead of sharing that action, we made a new action for each independent event? This reducer becomes a lot more readable we have a clear understanding of what events in the system result in a burger being added to the application state. So here I've replaced that generic action type with two specific actions that give us that kind of clarity. So how can we avoid this? Well, actions should really try to capture events and not commands. Instead of reusing actions or capturing commands in your actions, try to actually model your actions as unique events in your system. This will also help you avoid the need to dispatch multiple actions in a single call site. It's one of the most common questions Brandon and I get. How do I dispatch multiple actions from an effect? Well, the answer is you should probably never need to dispatch multiple actions from the same effect because you're capturing unique events 
with their own actions. So really, you want to make reducers and effects the decision makers in your application. This really boils down to separating the description of, of an event and the way it gets handled in your app. You don't want your components to decide how state changes. That's the kind of mess we're trying to avoid when we adopt NGRX. When we're using the command-driven action pattern, we are telling our components that they can decide how state changes. But that's not what we want. We want them to capture unique events, and we want to yield that decision-making process to our state changes and our side effects. The second pitfall is using generic action types. And it turns out this one is pretty related to the first pitfall. If you're avoiding action reuse and you're capturing unique events, you're probably already avoiding generic action types. But I still think it's worth discussing. So here I have an effect, and it's listening for when the user adds a taco to their cart. Let me tell you that from personal experience, when I come back to this effect in a year, I have no idea where this came from. I have to trace where this action was dispatched using my IDE to figure out how this effect got into my system. And that's not helping anybody. This also really comes into play when you're using the stored dev tools. Here, I have a stored dev tools log generated using the stored dev tools where I've chosen really generic action types. And there are so many details that are left ambiguous in this action log. Who dispatched which action? Which part of the system dispatched it? Was the action the result of user input, or was it from interacting with my backend API? But if instead I had chosen to use really descriptive action types, it becomes a lot more clear. And I bet just by reading this action log, you can probably guess how this application works. It's clear whether an action's coming from a page or if it's because I was interacting with the backend API. But these are still the same actions in my system. So from just reading the action log alone, I have a much more insight into how my application works. So if we go back to that same effect, and instead we use really clear and descriptive action types, it is gonna make it that much easier to understand this code when you come back to it in a year. I don't have to use my IDE to figure out what these actions are dispatched. I have really good context from these action types where these are being dispatched from. When you're picking an action type, you've seen this pattern a lot where we put in square brackets the source of an action and then we give a name to the event that arose from it. Try to pick really descriptive names from your sources. If it's an interaction with a backend API, suffix that source name with API. If it's from a component or a page, suffix it with component or page. It's gonna make your life a lot easier. So if you've ever heard this phrase, clean code is code you can read after a year and still be able to understand, well, I wanna kinda of put my own NGRX spin on it and say that good actions are actions you can read after a year and tell where they're being dispatched from. To give you some context as to why this is important, last year at the company that I worked, we underwent a lot of reorganization and it caused a bunch of new developers to join the product team that I was on. One of the engineers, her name is Sherry, commented to me after a week or so of getting caught up that the NGRX developer tools were a tremendous asset in getting ramped onto how the application worked. And it's because we were baking good action hygiene into that application. She could look at those dev tools and have a good understanding of how this app worked without having to actually look at too much source code. So help yourself and new developers to your project by writing clean actions. It really helps a lot. The third pitfall is action subtyping. What is action subtyping? Well, I really see developers fall into this pit when they wanna try and maybe handle click events for multiple options, or if they wanna handle API responses and errors in a generic way. So if we go back to that menu page, and instead of dispatching a unique action for every single button on that page, we went ahead and dispatched a generic add menu item action. And then we can specify the kind as additional property on that action. Well, I don't have to write as many actions if I did it this way, but there's some pitfalls when it comes when you wanna handle just a specific kind in this action type. So this process of adding additional kinds to actions is what I call action subtyping. So where's the pitfall? Well, the reason this is problematic is it starts to introduce conditional branches all throughout your application. And these nested conditionals are gonna really start to add up when you go to write unit tests for this application. Similarly, in an effect, we have to add additional filtering to our effect, and this is another kind of nested conditional. We're percolating these nested conditionals throughout this application. 
And what we want to do to make testing easier is we really want to avoid these nested conditionals and reducers and effects. If I had been explicit up front and, wrote in, and written those three really specific action types, I could have avoided these nested conditionals and all the tests that came with it. So I should have really taken the time up front to write better actions. So if instead we chose to write unique actions for each subtype, the reducer loses its conditional branch. This becomes a much easier test to write. Similarly for effects, if we use a specific action type and avoid subtyping, we lose the conditional. This effect becomes easier to test. So what we want to do is we want to constrain action types to be what I call narrow. Avoid putting yourself in a situation where you have to specify the kind or subtype or class of an action. Just leverage action type to describe the event. These are going to cause you to write more actions. That's guaranteed, and I know Indrex has a boilerplate problem, but it's worth doing. You're going to save yourself more time down the road by avoiding these nested conditionals that are going to appear in your application. It's really worth noting that there's a reason why we use switch statements. It's because you, they allow you to stack case statements. So even if you have multiple action types that result in the state, same state change, you can leverage case fall through to make the same state change as the result of multiple actions. Same for effects. Effects allow you to pass multiple action types into the uptype operator. So many action types can cause the same state or the same effect to start. This pattern of using multiple action types in your effects and reducers shouldn't be uncommon in an indirect application. So how can we avoid the pitfalls by applying good action hygiene? Well, this is sort of the breath of air is that there's always exceptions to the rule. There's a reason I've been using the word pitfall, and that's because sometimes it's perfectly fine to bring a safety ladder as a strategy for mitigating them. You're going to encounter code in situations where you're going to want to leverage these patterns, and as long as you are aware of what the downsides are, it's okay to use them. Without other way, I want to talk about some strategies for building good action hygiene into your process. And the first strategy is to put clarity ahead of brevity. This is really a driving force for NGRX. It's why it requires you to be so explicit. We assert that by spending time up front, by being very explicit about how side effects start or how state changes, you're going to save yourself time in the long run with, all the, or with how much easier it makes testing your application. This all goes towards writing more maintainable programs. The second thing to do is to really try to be empathetic in your architecture design choices. Like I was talking about with that story of Sherry, you need to consider the other developers on your team. By being more explicit and baking good action hygiene into your application, you're going to help other developers learn and debug your programs that you are writing better. So we really need to try to be empathetic for the other developers that are going to be helping us write this code. But the best way that I have found to avoid these pitfalls is to write actions first when you go build a new feature. This actually works really well from a process standpoint, because if you're on a team, you need the action to be written before you can write the reducers or the effects or the containers. So by writing those actions first, you're unblocking other developers on your team from building the rest of that feature in parallel. So how do I write actions first? Well, I divide the list of actions based on their event source. From there, I look at each source and I kind of divide them further. For the user actions, I divide them based on which page or component that they're coming from. For backend actions, I separate them based on the API that I'm going to be interacting with or capturing with that action. For device actions, I separate those based on the browser API that I'm going to be interacting with, whether that's a WebSocket or an IndexedDB connection. By doing this, I'm saving myself some time down the road. And how is that? Well, it's a lot easier to kind of avoid those action pitfalls. By separating them out and thinking through these actions up front, I'm going to avoid the need to write command-like actions, because I haven't even written my reducer functions yet. It's also going to help me avoid action subtyping, because I'm really teasing out all the different actions that exist in my application. I'm also avoiding subtyping. I'm truly capturing all the unique events that happen in my application. So really, when you're dividing these actions up, keep the action pitfalls in mind. Doing it this way is going to really help you avoid some of these practices that's going to make testing your application and reasoning about it harder. The second benefit 
to writing actions first is it gives you the time to think about hard problems. It turns out there's a couple of things that this lets you do. Well, even if your action list that you come up with is incomplete or has obvious gaps, it's a great way to help you sort of wrap your head around a feature. You're thinking about all the different interactions that happen within it. This will also help you be more discerning about the implementation. It's much easier to think about the state of your application when you've defined all of the events that are in it first. And so this helps you build a mental model for how various segments of your feature are going to connect by writing actions first. If you're on a team, it's also gonna help you develop a shared understanding of the problem with your teammates. I found that one of the biggest enablers of productivity is to develop a shared understanding of the problem space amongst your team. Nothing's gonna hurt your team's velocity more than finding out at the end of a project that you had different understandings of the problem you're trying to solve. This often leads to incompatible implementations. By designing and writing the actions together as a group, you can help develop a shared understanding of the problem and how the feature works. So, what is good action hygiene? Well, it's not reusing actions. This is gonna help make it clear what inputs to reducers and effects really are. It's gonna make those reducers and effects easier to read in a year's time. It's using descriptive action types. This is gonna help you improve debugability and traceability in your NGRX application. You're gonna be able to look at your NGRX action log and know where an action is coming from. It's about avoiding action subtyping. This is gonna keep unnecessary complexity out of your reducers and effects and make your tests easier to write. It's about focusing on clarity over brevity. You're gonna always try to lean towards explicit code over code that was fast to write. It's about empathy. I can't stress how important this one is. Try to anticipate how other developers on your team are gonna help you build this application. And finally, it's about writing actions first. This is gonna help you avoid these pitfalls and develop a deep understanding of the feature. Thank you.